Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to completely decode the most common form of extrapulmonary tuberculosis, which is tuberculous lymphadenitis. Now, before we get into the how and abouts of TB lymphadenitis, let's quickly recall that tuberculosis is a bacterial infection which is usually caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and in other cases by mycobacterium bovis and some atypical mycobacteria. The main mode of transmission of tuberculosis is by droplet infection and droplet nuclei, often by the cough and sneeze of an infected individual. Now, although TB mainly affects the lungs, where it is known as pulmonary tuberculosis, in about 15 to 20 percent of active cases, the infection spreads outside of the lungs, and this is known as extrapulmonary tuberculosis. 20 to 40 percent of extrapulmonary tuberculosis can be attributed to tuberculous lymphadenitis. So, this is the most common type of extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Now, in tuberculous lymphadenitis, the most common site of infection is in the cervical lymph nodes and especially the upper deep cervical lymph nodes. Apart from that, it can also affect the axillary lymph nodes, the paraiotic, the mesenteric and the inguinal lymph nodes. In the cervical, the most common area of occurrence is in the upper deep cervical lymph nodes, especially the jugulodigastric lymph node and in the posterior triangle lymph nodes. Now, in most instances, as I told you, uh, this is the jugulodigastric lymph node, okay? It is part of the upper deep cervical lymph nodes. So, in most instances, the bacilli enter this lymph node through the tonsillar crypts of the palatine tonsil, okay? So, from here, it spreads to here. Apart from that, in about 20% of the cases, the lymph nodes in the posterior triangle are affected by the involvement of adenoids which are present on the roof of the nasopharynx, okay? Now, more rarely, the infection can spread from the apex of the lungs towards the supraclavicular uh, lymph nodes by penetrating the suprapleural membrane, okay? And this will cause the enlargement of the supraclavicular lymph nodes. Apart from that, axillary and inguinal lymph nodes, the axillary and inguinal lymph nodes, are commonly involved in hematogenous or retrograde lymphatic spread. The clinical features, they include an increasing painless swelling of one or more of the lymph nodes associated with evening pyrexia, cough, when there is involvement of pulmonary tuberculosis and malaise. Apart from that, we also see failure to thrive if the sufferer is a child. Okay. So now coming to the most important part of tuberculous lymphadenitis, which are the stages of lymphadenitis. Okay, so first up we have lymphadenopathy, followed by matting, formation of a cold abscess, which progresses onto a colostar abscess and finally results in a sinus formation. Let's look at all of these stages one by one now. So in the first stage or the stage of lymphadenitis, we notice non-tender, firm, discrete and mobile lymph nodes that are palpable. So there are two things that I want you to note here. One, that these are palpable, non-tender swellings, okay? And this is because TB is not associated with acute inflammation. Besides that, histologically, they show non-specific reactive hypoplasia, okay? So these are palpable, non-tender, firm, discrete, mobile lymph nodes. In the next stage, or the stage of periodinitis or matting, we observe large, firm swellings that are fixed to the surrounding tissues and to each other and this uh, this nature of matting or being fixed to each other is due to the involvement of the capsule of the lymph nodes remember that this matting is pathognomic of tuberculosis okay now the next stage is the formation of cold abscess now this is due to caseating necrosis that happens within this it leads to extensive and caseated mold, which may liquefy and break down, giving rise to variable consistency with soft areas of cold abscesses and firm lymph nodes. Okay, so the things that you have to keep in mind regarding the cold abscess are that it is not associated with signs of cold, uh, of acute inflammation, like other abscesses. 
okay it is a cold absence and it shows no local rise of temperature no tenderness no redness and appears to be a soft fluctuant swelling okay now in the next stage so far we saw that this cold absence is confined by the deep fascia but in this stage the pus formation will pierce the deep fascia and form a swelling under the skin and this will result in two collections of pus okay one below the deep fascia and one below the skin which communicate through a narrow opening now this stage is called the stage of cholester abscess and it derives its name from a cholester which as well has two components okay finally the last stage is the stage of sinus formation so so far the pus had been confined by deep fascia then it pierced the deep fascia now it is confined by the skin now in the last stage it finally ruptures through the skin and forms a persistent discharging sinus okay so there is a formation of a persistent discharging sinus and the discharge from the sinus it will naturally be infected and can surround the surrounding skin causing extensive tuberculous ulcer now what you have to notice about the sinus is that they can be multiple they might have a wide opening undermined edges a bluish discoloration will be present around the sinus as well as there will be no induration okay so with this we have completed all the stages of uh, tuberculous lymphadenitis and i want you to pause the video here now and try to recall all the stages of tuberculous lymphadenitis along with the clinical features associated with them now if you got these right look for the stage of uh, firm non-tender palpable swelling followed by matting followed by caseating necrosis which led to cold abscess which pierced the deep fascia to form cholester abscess finally rupturing through the skin to form a sinus you're absolutely right and here's a thumbs up for you and if you didn't get this right it's okay just rewind okay so with this we come to the end of the video where we have seen the overview of cervical lymphadenitis we have seen the mode of infection the sites of infection as well as the stages and the clinical features in the next video we will continue on to the clinical manifestations the treatment and the diagnosis so thank you so much for watching i hope this helped you in some way and i'll see you in another lecture soon have a good day